Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for giving us a morning this morning to worship him in spirit and in truth. To lift up the glorious name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. We are uh, landing at the last chapter of Acts, Acts chapter 28. This will be the last message from the series. Acts chapter 28. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we covered Acts chapter 27, and uh, Joe was able to cover that pretty well. Um, we ended off with Paul and the 275 individuals in the ship um, experiencing a shipwreck, and uh, they grab onto whatever they can grab onto to float in the water, and they all come safely to a land which they will find is called Malta. So in chapter 28, Luke is bringing this entire historical narrative in the book of Acts of 28 chapters to a close by highlighting Paul's encounters with three different communities. He, is, uh, he, he starts off with Paul's encounters with this unreached people group, this pagan community, and then then he has interactions with this, a Christian community, and at the end, we see his interactions with the Jewish community in Rome. In verses 1 to 10 is where we see Paul's encounters with this individ, and the people in Malta. They're described in a very positive way as, as people with unusual kindness. And in many, you might have heard of stories, and there was one recent story of a person that uh, tried to go to an island somewhere around the coast of India, and, and uh, they ended up being uh, shot by an arrow. So the, the, the experiences that, that some would have going to a strange island might not be the same, but in this, uh, in this scenario, Paul and all the 20, uh, 275 individuals experienced unusual kindness. But upon reaching there, because it was kind of cold, verse 3 of chapter 28, I'm just going to kind of highlight some verses as we go through the chapter. It says that Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and put them on the fire, and a viper came out because of the heat and, the, and fastened on his hand. And so a, a, a venomous snake attacks Paul, and then we see uh, upon when that happened, the people there said, no doubt this person is a murderer. So this might, this might not be the first experience they had of seeing some kind of justice happening by nature. You know, this man who was shipwrecked now came on land and all of a sudden he is bit by a snake. In Malayalam, there's a term, right? Something like that, right? Same thing, like, you know, you have a, uh, you have a person that is already faced a misfortune, comes on land and now is bit by a snake. So you can... Um, you can see here uh, that the people naturally are interpreting this as justice. You know, the justice has, has uh, not allowed them to live. And there is a goddess in this island of Malta called Justice. And this kind of reminds me of what Paul has said, you know, in, when he uh, talks about the nature of man in Romans chapter 1, that, that in every human being, there is this in, in inherited inherent sense of wrong and good and bad. That, and then good will be uh, judged fairly and the evil will be punished. This is put in every person, whether what they, whether they, whatever they believe or not. And in our culture today, this is kind of uh, seen in the form of a, a word that really was adopted from India, but karma or karma, you know. Uh, and so, you know, when people see something bad happen to someone, they say, Oh, that's karma, you know, uh, this instant karma and all these different forms of karma. And, and so here they're sort of taking it in the same way. But we can see from here. And so what happens? Paul, uh, Paul shakes that, that snake and throws him into the fire. And upon that, they waited for a little bit just to see if there are any ill effects. And he didn't have any and they, nothing happened to him. So they, now they changed their mind and they believe that he was a God. And now in our life, God takes us through circumstances. And, and many might interpret that as karma or God's punishment towards you. 
But what if God allowed that to happen so that by overcoming that, test, that, that challenge, that you are now becoming a testimony to the very same people who judged you wrongly? Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So what, what has happened to you hasn't harmed you. What has happened to you hasn't destroyed you. What has happened to you should not even cause you to write off your own life. If you are remaining alive, if you are still remaining in his love, you are a miracle. And we see here that not only that, Paul goes on to, uh, he does a healing ministry on the island. And he cures the father of this prominent chief of Malta. And he experiences this, uh, this father has a, a kind of fever and dysentery that it, it, it's called the Malta fever. It was common in, amongst people in that island. And Paul goes on to heal many more people in that island. And they go sailing forward. And when, now we see Paul stopping a couple of places, and, uh, and there's this place called Putioli. And, and there, verse 14, uh, Luke says, There we found brothers, and we were invited to stay with them for seven days. And so we came to Rome. And the brothers there, uh, when they heard about us, came as far as the Forum of Appius and the Three Caverns to meet us. On seeing them, Paul thanked God and took courage. Here we see Paul's interaction with the Christian community. And here we see the beauty of fellowship. In Malta, you saw people with an unusual kindness, but Paul was in a, a mode of ministering. He was a minister in, pour, in, minister, in, a, in a mode of pouring out. And, but in, when he came to Putioli and saw the believers, we see that he was encouraged and he thanked God. He, and so this is, the, this is the beauty of fellowship that we should also experience, that the Christian community in our life shouldn't be unlike any other community in our life. Unfortunately, we find, an, we find comfort in the Malta, people of Malta in our life, the people that might not know God, might not understand our heart, and might not understand what we believe, but they show unusual kindness. But we ought to be like the people and the brothers in Putioli who, when a person like Paul came, it encouraged him, gave him comfort in his heart, gave him, you know, strengthened him in the faith and, and, and allowed him to have a moment of being, gra being grateful to God. And now we move forward, we see Paul in Rome. Paul reaches Rome and, and it says here that after three days, he called together the local leaders of the Jews, and when they had gathered, and this is verse 17, he had said to them, and he goes on to talk about what happened to him, which we have covered many times, so I'm not going to cover that. But I, when we go, when we skip on forward, verse 23, they, they, so they appoint this time to come back and, and to hear more about this, this sect. That, you know, the, the, the Jewish leaders there knew that, knew, heard about Christianity, that this was a controversial, you know, controversial group of people uh, that and but they didn't know a lot about this so paul um paul gathers them back and verse 23 there's a day appointed that they all they're coming to him and so the nature of paul's um residence right now is that he uh he is there's a soldier with him and he is living in a house that belongs to him and in, in a lot of these cases the soldier uh, is chained to him so he cannot go anywhere he's pretty much stuck in the house so the paul who loves to travel and loves to go place to place even if he is con confined to his own home people are coming to him even even if he cannot go out and, and minister in unreached places we see that people that god is sending people to him so that he can continue his ministry of spreading the gospel he says and it says there verse 23 from morning Till evening, he expounded to them, testifying to them the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus from the law of Moses and from the prophets. And some were convinced what he said and others disbelieved. And disagreeing amongst themselves, they departed after Paul made one statement. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet, go to these people and say, you will indeed hear but never understand. You will indeed see but never perceive. For these, the, this people's hearts are grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they, should ha they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I will heal them. 
Verse 28, Therefore let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will listen. So, and uh, pa Pastor C.S. Matthew covered some of this uh, early this morning. Praise God for that. We see, um, we see that Paul is doing what Paul does. When Paul goes, especially when he goes to a new area, he first visited the synagogues. Like the, there's, Paul has a heart for the Jewish people. He, even though there are places where he dusted his feet and he, he moved on to the he will say, he said, I'm going to move on to the Gentiles. There's still something pulling him back. And we can see that when we read through Romans 9 through 11, Paul's heart for the Jewish people, that this unceasing anguish in his heart. He said, I wish I could be cut off from my brothers, my Jewish brothers and sisters. And so Paul, again, you know, I, I can just imagine everything is at their fingertips for the Jewish people to understand. Everything has been given. It, it's just a matter of them to, their eyes to be open, their ears to be open, their heart to be open. And again, he is trying to reason with them. And try, it says morning till evening, trying to show Jesus for, through the prophets of, of the Old Testament. And then he quotes Isaiah chapter 6. As we know, the, the famous chapter in Isaiah chapter 6 where Isaiah sees the Lord high and exalted. And, and, and at the end, um, you know, the, the, uh, the voice in heaven says, who will go for us? And Isaiah says, uh, here I am, send me. And then uh, right upon that, right after that, this is what it said. This verse is in 26 to 27. The ministry of sharing the gospel is not about success. The ministry of sharing the gospel is about being faithful to the gospel message. There will be people who will reject what you have to say. It is hard. It is hard to take rejection. I, I know it firsthand. The ministry of the gospel is to be faithfully explained without any kind of sugary substances or any kind of taking away from the message. It is a controversial message. It is a divisive message. But at the same time, it is a message that will heal. It's a message that brings salvation. It's a message that brings wholeness. And so we need to be faithful regardless of the consequences, regardless of what kind of feedback we get, to be faithful in sharing the gospel. Amen. Amen. So we read in uh, verse 30 says that Paul lived two years in, in this condition. And in, this, in these two years... What we know of is he, is he wrote four epistles. And these are the prison epistles of Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon, and Philippians. Very wonderful and deep uh, epistles that we all read and we cherish even today. And you can kind of see his state of mind in all those four epistles. He calls himself a prisoner of Christ. He mentions about his chains. And then in one particular portion I want to read here, the state of mind is kind of seen. Philippians chapter 1, 12 to 14. Philippians chapter 1, 12 to 14. I want, to, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. So that it has become known through the whole imperial guard and to the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are more bold to speak the word without fear. So, you know, Paul was prevented to, to share the gospel place to place, but like I said, God, you know, God brought people to him, and, and, and Paul's perspective is that, you know, e that even if the, you know, um, that even if he was going through the suffering of being imprisoned and chained, the gospel was being advanced. You know, that, that's how he, he viewed his circumstance, that, that through my imprisonment, through the chains that I have, even though it is embarrassing, while there are uh, people that are discrediting me out in the churches and there, there are these you know, flashy preachers that are in the, in the churches spreading false, uh, for the false gospel, I'm here as a fool being chained, chained so that the imperial guard, the, the Roman rulers, the, even Caesar's household, can know Jesus, that I am being imprisoned for Jesus. Without Paul being going through this, none of them would have known. So if, if it means that the gospel will advance, I will be content with my sufferings. I will rejoice. I will rejoice in my sufferings. And that is the message in Philippians as we, as we know. So, you know, Acts chapter 28 ends, 
in a kind of a unresolved note, we, we, you know, if you've read it, you know that, you know, with all the details given up to this point, all of a sudden it ends in 31 saying that, you know, Paul proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. And this is, this kind of, I mean, when I, when I was studying through this and reading through this, I, I, I wished in my heart that, that there was a little bit more, more of a closure and ending to this, but um, that, that's not how the Holy Spirit wanted us to, to, to end because of m- many different reasons, which I'll cover. So what, what happens to Paul after this? There are three more epistles that Paul has to write. And th- again, these, all these things are just uh, uh, are different theories and, and conclusions made by scholars. But uh, there are three more epistles, the pastoral epistles that Paul has to write even after this. So uh, at some point, and, and, and so the three, the three pastoral epistles are First and Second Timothy and Titus. And when we read First, and, First Timothy and Titus, he does not mention about his imprisonment. But he does in Second Timothy. And so that gives a, a clue as to there, there must have been a period of time after these two years of ha- being ha- prison, in prison in his own house that he was let go. And so um, because he mentions in Titus that he was in a place called uh, Nicopolis, which is in Greece. And there are, there's a lot of people that he, he encounters and he talks about different places like Crete and, and, all, and he places Titus there. And so there, there is at least a few more, a couple more years uh, after this point that we read in Acts, uh, and so, um, so, and, and then some say that he went as far as Spain. Uh, at least he desired to go to Spain. And some say he went to Britain on the way. We we don't have any clear evidence for that. And so, what happens? What drastically changes that environment for Christians in the Roman Empire was this great fire in Rome, um, and it happened around AD 64, and, and uh, two thirds of Rome. Uh, was destroyed in this fire, and the fire lasted for nine days. And and what is said is that that possibly Nero is the one that started this, so that he can rebuild Rome to his liking. Uh, but in any case, Nero pointed the blame to the Christians, and so as a result, Christians were persecuted in Rome, and 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 killed in severe ways. And I'm not going to describe in all the ways because it's uh, it, it is very gruesome. And, and so, so Second Timothy, in, in the epistle, we get a glimpse as to what, is, what ha- may have happened leading up to Paul's second imprisonment. This is his final imprisonment. This leads uh, to his uh, eventual uh, death. Second Timothy 4, 14 to 18. Second Timothy 4, 14 to 18. Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Beware of him yourself, for he strongly opposed our message. At my first events, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them, but the Lord stood by me and strengthened me, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed, and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. So this is just many, there are many theories about this, but it is possible that this Alexander the coppersmith may have betrayed Paul or may have uh, given a false accusation to, uh, that may have resulted in Paul's imprisonment. That, that's, again, it's just, a, just one of the many theories. And it looks like at that point, many of the people that were with Paul fled him. And Paul mentioned them by, mentions them by name. And then he mentions that uh, he was rescued from the lion's mouth. Whether that is literal or figurative, we don't know. But that l- feeding people to the lion was one of the ways that people were punished. And, and there could have been a circumstance where he was. He went through that but was uh, rescued from it. But in, in any case, Paul's time uh, came to an end in, his, in the age of his 60s, uh, early 60s perhaps. And when he was... Uh, it is said that he was beheaded uh, around AD 67. So when we think about Acts as a whole and, and, and going forward, you know, we can somehow be dissatisfied because the, Acts does, the book of Acts does not end in a, in a clean conclusion. But my view is it might be intentionally done by the Holy Spirit just to make a point that the church of Jesus Christ is, is not dependent on Paul. The church of Jesus Christ is not dependent on a Peter 
who we don't see uh, uh, after Acts, Acts 15. Peter just vanishes, you know, in terms of Paul, you know, when, when Luke mentions it, Peter, it's almost like Peter didn't, uh, has, is not a, a key, key leader, which he is, but in the, in, in the book, he's not mentioned. But, uh, and, and so, you know, so, so, it did, so the, the church of Jesus Christ is not dependent on you or me, right? In every generation, God raises up people to do his purpose, to fulfill his purpose. It is his purpose. It is not our purpose. You know, we, uh, unfortunately, we, we settle, we talk, talk a lot about legacy and wanting to have a great legacy. And unfortunately, sometimes that becomes an idol in our life, that this legacy, uh, uh, leaving a spiritual legacy. I, I agree with it. I think we all need to. But at the, at the same time, when you look at the big scheme of things, this is about God's kingdom being expanded across the earth, and we get to partake in his mission. This is about God and his kingdom. This is about God and his mission. And we, by his grace, are called to serve and to fulfill his mission on this earth. So by the grace of God, you know, over the uh, last two, uh, two, two years and four months, uh, we covered this book and uh, about 87 messages. I took the time to count. It was, I don't know if that was needed. Um, uh, this, uh, this book is called The Acts of the Apostles, and, and that's a fair, fair title to put. You know, one could say that the, the, the first part of the book is Acts of Peter, and some could say the latter part is Acts of Paul, or you can say that this is the Acts of the early church, because you know, it's not just Paul and Peter. There were many evangelists and ordinary believers that, that made a huge impact in the, in the church and, and in the kingdom. Um, and so when we look at the continuation of Acts, over the last 2,000 years since this book was written, we know the Church of Jesus Christ has, has, has only expanded the miracles and, and, and great works of God have only continued. And God continues to raise up men and women of God to be witnesses of Christ. So, you know, the era of the apostles may have been the apostles as in capital A apostles and may have been covered in this book, but the acts of the Holy Spirit still continue. And so this book can also be appropriately titled the acts of the Holy Spirit because the same things continue even today. Hallelujah. The church of Christ was established on the day of Pentecost, where 120 men and women were praying together. They're waiting for the promise of the Father, as Jesus commanded. They were baptized by the Holy Spirit. And they received supernatural boldness, and they received spiritual gifts. And the church exploded from that day on forward. So looking at the book of a whole, I, I, I really want us to cover and talk about how can we see the activity of the Holy Spirit through this book. One, the, 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 we see that the Holy Spirit glorifies Jesus Christ. Above, above the things that we sometimes focus on, which is the, spirit, you know, the gifts and the signs and the wonders, the, the purpose and the mission of the Holy Spirit is to glorify Christ. There's no, there's no division between the, the persons in the, tri, in the tri, triune God. The, pers, the purpose of the Holy Spirit is to lift up Christ. So wherever Christ is lifted up, whether it's this Sunday morning, whether it's in our lives, whether it's in our actions, there is the Holy Spirit empowering people, empowering men and women of God to glorify and lift up the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus said that, Jesus said that the Holy Spirit will glorify me. And the Holy Spirit will bring into remembrance the things that Christ taught the disciples. The Holy Spirit will convict the world of righteousness and the judgment to come. Without the Holy Spirit, no one can say Jesus is Lord. So when we see unbelievers repenting of their sin and trusting in Jesus, when we see ourselves confessing our sins and repenting of our sins, know that the Holy Spirit is doing a miraculous work, even today. Second, the Holy Spirit gives gifts to edify believers. Spiritual gifts and supernatural gifts are not given for our own personal benefit, for our own personal glory. It's not given to so that we can put it on social media. It's given to build up others. It's given to expand the gospel to the ends of the earth. Like the people in Malta who had no exposure to the gospel. There Paul performs many signs and wonders and then shares the gospel along with it to, to confirm the veracity of scripture and, and, the, and the gospel. 
Third, the Holy Spirit appoints people for his service. We know that when Paul and Barnabas and a, and a group of uh, men were gathered in the, in the Antioch church were gathering together, they're worshiping Jesus, they're fasting. The Holy Spirit said, separate for me Paul and Barnabas for the work for which I have called them. The Holy Spirit took Philip the, uh, the evangelist and, and took him right to the Ethiopian eunuch. The Holy Spirit appoints people and, and calls out people for his service. Hallelujah. Fourth, the Holy Spirit gives boldness. When the going gets tough, when persecution rises, we don't have to fear. The Holy Spirit gives us boldness. We see it several times in the book of Acts. Especially the prayer for of boldness with the church praise right before the huge persecution comes that, that, uh, that scatters the church. He gives, he gives the words to speak so that we can speak with boldness in front of rulers and authorities. Five, the Holy Spirit builds true fellowship. For the first time, we see a, a, a spirit-filled community. We talked about the word koinonia, the community of one another, the ko- the, 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 a, a community of oneness and unity and love and fellowship and sharing together. And he transforms us to love others with, with a sincere heart. And it, be, it begins with each one of us being filled in the Holy Spirit, not coming up with, not coming up with ways of, of trying to force ourselves into experiencing fellowship, but to be filled in the Holy Spirit, each of ourselves, so that we can find the oneness in the Spirit together. Amen. Number six, Holy Spirit gives direction. The Holy Spirit, uh, we, we know, uh, we covered this, that Holy Spirit prevented at, at sometimes from the mission to go in certain places or the Holy Spirit allowed or uh, gave a prompting in the hearts of the apostles to, to go to certain areas. And when a decision had to be made, uh, you know, I think it was James that said, the Holy Spirit it seems good to us and the Holy Spirit. You know, when decisions are made in a church body, we ought to be able to say with a clear conscience that this seems good to us and the Holy Spirit. We need we need the help of the Holy Spirit even for the most minute decisions in the body of Christ. You might ask, how does that look like? I don't, I don't know that either. But I, all I can say is that if we are true to our own selves and our own consciences, if we come with a clear conscience and a clear heart and, and the Holy Spirit who brings order, who, bring, who brings counsel and wisdom, able to bring about and make decisions, uh, help us make decisions together as one body of Christ. Lastly, the Holy Spirit brings discipline. When Ananias and Sapphira lied to the church, what did Peter say? Peter said, how can you do such a thing and lie to the Holy Spirit? Uh, how, and, and he said to Sapphira, how, how can you test the Holy Spirit? And as we know, the judgment came upon both of them very swiftly. We should not forget that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Because it is God who works in us. Hallelujah. The God of God, the God of the Holy Spirit is working in us. So we need to develop in us a fear, a a, a healthy fear, a reverence of him. Because he is working in us to renew us into his image, in the image of Christ. And so the Holy Spirit brings discipline. When we come to a body, when we come to a a body like this, we ought to have some amount of reverence and fear. That we are in the presence of God. That, that, That God can use men and women in this congregation to speak a word Speak a word not only of encouragement, but also of correction. That those who speak from here, those, who's, those who lead singing, that you should, that our, our, our eyes should be open, our ears should be open, our hearts should be open to hear not only the encouraging words, but also the correcting words of the Holy Spirit to change our ways, to repent of our sins when the Holy Spirit calls us to do so. And as I conclude, I want to invite the worship team to come forward. It is one thing to... Uh, the cherish the past and to look at the book of the apostles, uh, the acts of the apostles and, and say, you know, oh, what, how great it was back then. We might, we might be very nostalgic and we might, uh, uh, and we all like to say that, oh, the good old days, you know. Uh, but if this is the acts of the Holy Spirit, if the Holy Spirit is still living and active in, in us and in, in amongst the church, even in this very strange climate, of this pandemic and all the different things that are going in our life, the Holy Spirit can bring about unique ways of ministering and unique ways of living 
even this, in this very, uh, very strange times. Today we have unprecedented freedom. We can go anywhere to preach the gospel. We have unimaginable wealth. We're so much more prosperous than any other generation before us. We have unlimited access to any part of the globe. Right now as we speak, this video is going out to all parts of the world. Anybody can tune in. That was unheard of. That would have been uh, something thought of crazy in the time of the apostles. The gospel of Christ could be shared with far less hindrance than any time in human history. So the question that I ask, not just I'm asking you, but asking myself is, are we taking advantage of the slumber? Are we using this unprecedented freedom to, to cause us to commit sin and to, and, uh, without consequence and do whatever we like? Are we using this unimaginable wealth that to uh, cause us to love money more and to make money uh, our master? This unlimited access to the world through the internet, are we using that to be held hostage to, inter to, to, to uh, entertainment and wasting our time or are we using it to bless others? So if the Holy Spirit were to write today in this particular season, this particular era, what would he say about us? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come in Jesus' name. We thank you and praise you, O oh God. That through the last two, uh, two, months, uh, two years and four months, you enabled your servants to speak from this precious book, Lord. And we thank you, God, that you are the one who, who gives enlightenment. You're the one who, who speaks. And we thank you. We lay, down all of, uh, we lay down all of our pride and everything, oh God, that uh, we have a sense of accomplishment at your feet. We thank you, oh God, that you enabled us to cover this book verse by verse. And we pray, O oh Lord God, as we have thought about a lot of things this morning, Holy Spirit, have your way in our congregation, O oh God. Help us to humble ourselves and to seek, as we prayed this morning, to seek more of the Spirit acting in our lives from the individual up to leadership, Lord. Every aspect of this church, O oh God, we humbly commit to you, Holy Spirit. I pray that you will work in a way much more strongly than what we read in the pages of Scripture, O oh Lord. We, we just pray, O oh God, in these days, Lord, help us to repent of our sin, O oh Lord. Help us to repent of our complacency, O oh Lord. Lord, open our eyes, open our ears, open our heart. As, as Paul laid that convicting message to the Jewish people, I don't know how they processed it, but Lord, we are here, O oh God, to ask that our ears will be open, our our eyes will be open. Our hearts will be open. Help us not to have a hardened heart. Help us not to have a heart of stone. But I pray, O oh God, that our hearts will be uh, hearts of flesh, willing to do anything for the kingdom, O oh Lord. And I pray, O oh Lord, this moment, Lord, you will speak to many sitting here, O oh Lord, who are here with arms wide open to receive more of your Holy Spirit to be used in a mighty way, O oh Lord, to do things that they could not have never imagined by the power of the Holy Spirit. I pray that they will be, O oh God, empowered individuals, full in power, full in, in Lord, full in anointed, O oh Lord, full with the gifts of the Spirit to bless others. Oh Lord, I pray, O oh Lord, you will call out your, your, your people, O oh God, for ministry. I pray that you will call out, O oh God, sons and daughters from this congregation, O oh Lord. Lord, to do mighty things for your name, O oh Lord God. We lift up every single person from the young to the old, O oh Lord, in your presence. We summon us ourselves completely into your hands. We praise you and thank you, O Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.